Well, he left England as a fiery man of steel and returns as an NRL gladiator. Over 400 first-class rugby league games, James Graham is the undisputed lion-hearted champion. Well, the NRL is full of madmen, but you, James Graham, bring a very special brand of passion. And it's not to be fooled by your very fun personality off the field, but between the posts, you were all business all the time. You never had a moment off. So what drove you? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, look, I'm probably a love of our sport and an appreciation of our sport and um, kind of that... That, that passion and that bit of madness has sort of like got me um, got me a few games under my belt. So if you're lucky enough to find something as a as a career that that you love, not many people are fortunate enough to do that. So if you, I guess if you're blessed in that way, you should do it passionately. So born and bred in Magul. Magul. Magul yeah, yeah. in Merseyside. Uh, sporting facilities include bowls. Tennis, this is off Wikipedia. Bowls, yeah. <laughs> tennis, next to the town hall, football and cricket clubs playing on the old hall field. So nowhere listed there is rugby league. So when did that come into your life? Yeah, um, so my, my dad comes from um, a place called Maryport in Cumbria where there's, it's a bit more of a rugby league hotbed. Um, he met my mum, they moved to, um, to Liverpool. Um, and but dad has always been a rugby league fan. So he'd go to the Challenge Cup final every year um, down at Wembley, him, him and my granddad. I think it was Wigan versus Widnes um, in 1993. He got the bus from St Helens. He said he stopped for supplies uh, on the way to the bus, which now I know means alcohol, <laughs> um, some cans of beer for the way down. Not Good sandwiches. <laughs> not, sal not supplies, no. Um, fisherman's friends and probably a four-pack of skull for me dad. Um, so yeah, he, there was a little note on there, um, the notice board saying uh, St. Helens Crusaders under sevens or under eights need players call Andy Fairhurst on this number. Um, so he jotted the number down and um, when he got back late on the Saturday, Sunday, he's like, how do you fancy playing rugby, son? And I was like, what's rugby? I, d I don't know. Like I'd sort of seen it on the TV, but I didn't know the difference between league and union. I was really into me football as a kid play like at school it was break time you play football well when I say football soccer uh, lunchtime soccer you finish school you go home you go to the park you play soccer and um, that's all it was it was just relentless and then dad sort of found this spanner in the works of of trying rugby and i don't know i, I said go on then let, let's let's give it a whirl so i went down on the wednesday and they were playing a game and they i, I honestly genuinely didn't know the rules um I probably had seen more, again, like, I'd seen bits of it. I'd seen, I didn't know if it was more like American football. Um, yeah, and then I started playing and I instantly fell in love with it. And I can remember at the end of the game, though, we, um, they said, let's make a tunnel for the opposition and clap them through. Now, where I came from, we used to play a game called Tunnel of Death. So if you didn't score in this game, all the lads would make a tunnel and the person that didn't score had to run through and you could kick them as they ran through. And at the end of this rugby game, they've gone, let's make a tunnel for the opposition. And I've just gone, hang on a minute, are they going to run the tunnel? Like, and then tunnel we, we, of death we, time. Tunnel of death time, like, <laughs> and then they're just clapping them through. I'm like, oh, OK. And then, yeah. You didn't like, have an inkling to give him no, a kick? I was close to going. Um, so, yeah, anyway, they, they said after the game, um, do you want to do you want to come back on Saturday for training? I was like, yeah, I do. And then, I guess the rest is history. But then going to school, um, I was just known as like the egg chaser because I was the only kid that played rugby. No one else. E everyone was football, you know. And yeah, so being at school, like playing rugby, um, it was just I was a bit different. Um, but yeah, I I, from, from, I can remember playing for the first time and just instantly, instantly falling in love. So what was the backyard like at home? One of seven. <clears throat> was it rowdy? Yeah, there was never a dull moment. Um, there was always someone in trouble, mainly me. You? Uh, yeah, middle child syndrome and all that, you know. So, yeah, it was an interesting household, um, to say the least.
your parents, John and Diane, uh, they made a very special appearance for your 400th, which was a wonderful surprise. But thinking about all those years, seven kids to look after, what sort of sacrifices did they make, you know, during their working days, their, their home life on the weekends, just to make sure you and, and all of your siblings had everything you needed? Yeah, um, mum and dad did, did so much and it probably wasn't um, until quite recently that I sort of realised the, um, like, the impact of me playing sport and when you become a parent yourself, you sort of reflect on those, those moments. So, um, yeah, it's um, a, a huge sacrifice that, that dad made to, to, to sort of give me an opportunity to, to play rugby as a kid and, and it wasn't about he wasn't doing it for me to play in the NRL or play in Super League or anything like that. He was just doing it um, because he, he seen that I enjoyed it. And um, I probably owe my, my family a, a, a huge a huge thank you for, for all they did for me. So this egg chaser, as you called yourself, becomes this fiery red-headed teenager with a temper to match and you catch selectors eye. You've come through the St Helens system. On August 15, 2003, a 17-year-old James Graham makes his Super League debut against Castleford. If you could go back to that, that moment, what would you tell young James is about to step onto the field? Oh, I don't know. It was a scary moment, scary time in my life that um, should probably sue Ian Millward for child abuse. Like, I, I was just a kid, like, just a boy. I wasn't ready, um, you know, and I... I guess all I'd been, you know, sorry, not all I'd been doing, but a, a lot of what I wanted to do was make my fest, professional um, debut. And, and then it came and it was, uh, it was frightening. I was still at school. I was still, I think I went to school in the morning and it was um, just a, a 20 minute um, little cameo appearance at the end. But I just, I remember when it finished, I was just relieved it was over. It was just a sigh of relief that it was done because I probably didn't think I belonged there. When did you know that you belonged? I guess I still don't. Um, you know, um, it's, it's, I think, a feeling that, that never goes away, that, um, that want to keep performing and keep trying to improve. If you take things for granted, I think it, you, the privilege of playing sport will be taken away from you. You survived and you went on 17 tests, 224 Super League games. So then why would England's Man of Steel decide that he wants to come down and and beat the best from down under? Yeah, I'd, I'd came out here um, on a couple of tours when I was younger. And I can remember thinking then and sort of daring to dream about where the career might go. Um, that if I got the opportunity, I'd, I'd come and play over here. So there was that. And then there was also the fact that um, I really enjoyed how Australians treat rugby league. Like that it is so serious that it's on the back page for good and bad. Um, that it's, I guess, some might argue, but it's one of the national sports. It's the headlines on uh, all the major networks news. Um, it's such a big deal. And I was like, I want and no disrespect to, to Super League. It doesn't create that amount of, of interest and headlines back home. Um, and I kind of wanted to be a part of that. You're a very lovable character and you've changed our game forever, which we're eternally grateful for. But let's look at some of the more controversial moments and you've given us a few over the years. We'll begin with Good Friday when it turned bad and you were charged with dissent towards your actions towards the referee, Jared Sutton. Do you think that the emotion or the occasion got the better of you? Um, I was just wrong. The, the rule is that you can't come into contact with the kicker's legs and I didn't know that, so I thought it was about intent. Um, that was never my intent. I, you could see I waved on the, the trainer when I realised Adam was hurt, but um, yeah, I definitely got that one wrong. And the backlash, especially around Belmore, like the, the Bulldogs fans, they are passionate mm. and, and they see your action, so then that fuels them. And it felt like at ANZ Stadium, the whole world was imploding at that point. Yeah, I probably didn't realise um, the, the, the sort of effect that that, that had. Um, and, you know, the toughest part is it's not just you that deals with it. Like, it ripples it ripples to, to people that are around you. It, what, what it does do, though, is it, it, it shows who's actually in your corner. You, f you find out who's there for you and who's just around for the good times. Um, yeah, and the, after a couple of moments there, I spent some time with some people and 
um, really put things into perspective and um, yeah, it, yeah, obviously it, it, it's not sought after, but those, those sort of things can, can build you and stand you instead for, the, I guess, the tragedy of life. People like Des Hasler, people like Wayne Bennett, did they, they help you with that impulse control? I mean, we can now go back to the tunnel of death. I mean, the impulse control has <laughs> been there since day dots. And what was their advice to you to make sure that you had the longevity and you had the, the legacy and the reputation that you wanted at the end of all this? Yeah, I guess it's a little bit about cause and effect um, and taking responsibility. That's, that's fundamentally what it comes down to. For your coaches, who was the most influential? Um, Daniel Anderson uh, at St Helens. So going back and um, I think, <clears throat> you know, you spoke about my, my time as a, as a youngster. I was, you know, always in and around the, the sort of the, the England teams and the representative teams growing up. And then I came into first team and, and Daniel became the coach. He sat me down and he was complimentary of the way I played um, that year under him and he... He was just, he, he just ma he mapped a few things out for me and he made me see sort of my journey differently. Or was I just gonna be a passenger and just go along to get along? Or was I actually gonna have targets and things to aim for? And it, I, I'm, I'm so fortunate that, um, that he managed to have that chat with me because I was probably during that, the, the back end of that was just sort of coasting along a little bit. Um, but he, he really helped me with, with um, sort of setting goals and aspiring to, to different things, especially coming out from that, from that junior age where you've always just been circling around the top um, and being picked all the time. So, yeah, it was um, crucial for me. Refined, cultured, daytime Matthew. Then the sun goes down. 